Um, now, the question that we have for this evening's seminar is, what does China want? Um, it's a really important time to be asking this question. Um, obviously, China's been um, developing very, very rapidly over the last 30 years, and everyone knows about the economic miracle uh, that's been going on. Um, but also militarily, um, politically, um, socially, and culturally, uh, it's changing, it's transforming. Um, and obviously people outside of China are really intrigued to know, you know, what does China want? I mean, there's so much, so much happening. Um, but I think maybe even more importantly, certainly from my perspective, uh, internally, domestically, this is a really uh, important question. Um, and I want, if you bear with me just for, for two minutes, to um, tell you a, a, a quick anecdote. Um, again, it's an anecdote, it's not based on research. Um, but I first went out to China um, in 1989. Um, I went out um, the, the day after the Tiananmen Square protests were broken up. Um, and I had a ticket from Hong Kong up to Guangzhou. Um, and I ended up smuggling newspapers into China. It's another story. Um, but when I was there, I spoke to lots of people. Um, and I asked a lot, a lot of people, what motivates you? you know, what, what, what are the kind of things that you're, you know, that, that make you want to kind of get out of bed and you know, work and so on? And, and a lot of people said to me, I want to be rich and I want my country to be rich. And I thought this was very interesting because it kind of summed up in a way what I felt was, was quite important at that time, this idea that through individual endeavor, um, there's a collective good. You know? and, then, and people seem to be focused on this idea of you know, wanting to do well themselves as individuals, but then also to, um, to, to you know, help uh, China. Um, fast forward a couple of decades, um, now I'm a business school professor, and kind of going out and doing lots of work in, in China. I asked the same question to people, um, and typically the response that I got back was, I want to be rich. That was it. Um, and again, this makes you kind of think, so where's the, the, the collective kind of consciousness uh, gone? We won't dwell on that. Most recently, so in the last two or three years, I asked the same question, and you say, you know, what motivates? People say, I don't know, really. You know, I think I want to be happy. I want some spiritual fulfillment. I want. I don't re really quite know what what I want. And I just think this is a kind of an interesting anecdotal. I know, but a kind of an interesting trajectory um, that I have detected in in, in 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 a certain way. Now, I'm really intrigued to know what China does want. You know, in in, in all of these kinds of dimensions. And we've got an absolutely um, outstanding speaker here tonight who can answer this question, hopefully, for us in many, many, many different ways, uh, in Rob Gifford. Um, just a, a few words about um, Rob. He read uh, Chinese studies at Durham, um, and then went out to Harvard to read um, regional studies focusing on East Asia. Um, he's been learning Mandarin since uh, age seven. Um, I'm not sure whether he's ever finished learning Mandarin, but, um, he might tell us a bit later. He's then spent um, more than two decades um, studying, visiting, uh, and reporting uh, on the country. He's worked as a radio correspondent for the BBC, um, for the World Service. Um, he's worked out in uh, Boston, uh, WGBH. Um, he's also worked for the National Public Radio um, to work as China correspondent. Many of you will know the books he's written. He wrote in particular, China Road, A Journey into the Future of the Rise of Power. Um, which recounts you know, a wonderful journey that he took over, I think, six weeks um, uh, from Shanghai up to the Kazakh border. Um, in 2011, he joined The Economist uh, and was the magazine to China editor uh, until very recently. He now continues to work as a, as, as a correspondent. Rob will get up in a minute and talk, but before he does so, I also just want to say a few words of thanks to um, the uh, people who've actually made this uh, seminar possible, in, in particular the Kirkwood uh, Foundation um, and CRCC Asia. Um, Tom Kirkwood uh, is over here, and I'm going to invite him up in, in, in just a second. Um, Red Oriental Studies here um, and wrote 
uh, a dissertation on China's oil and gas uh, development strategy. Subsequently, he's had an enormously successful business career uh, in China. And I won't go through all of the things, but the list is too long. Um, but he's had a, a huge impact, I think, on trade and, um, and so on over the years. Um, he's a board member of Sina Geophysical, uh, a shareholder of EPEG, and so on and so forth. So very, very interesting. If the students here, if you want to speak to someone who knows what it's like, please you know, speak to Tom uh, afterwards. Um, more recently, um, the Kirkwood Foundation has been involved in lots of uh, very important charitable uh, endeavours, and you know, we're very grateful for this being uh, a, a part of that whole uh, thing that, that, that's going on. Um, but CRCC Asia is also funding um, internships uh, to encourage uh, people from around the world to go to China and actually to, to, to work there and experience what's, what's going on. And I'm going to hand over to Tom because we've got an announcement about some of the internships that we've been Thank you. Thank you, uh, Simon Learman. Thank you, Judge Business School. Thank you, Pembroke. And all of the esteemed audience we have today, which actually, uh, just to, to point out, is a Q&A. So after the main lectures delivered by Rolf Gifford, which I think you'll all very much enjoy, I would love it if you <coughs> have questions to uh, open it up to the field of, of esteemed panelists as well. So I'm Tom Kirkwood, um, and I was lucky enough to receive <coughs> a first class education without a first class degree here at Cambridge, um, but made my way out to Asia. I do have just one thing to say. Maybe the, pose the question, what does China need as a <coughs> to what does China want in your thoughts as we, as we go forward here? Um, China for me uh, is, a, is a conundrum. Uh, but one thing is certain, for a vast amount of Chinese history, the mercantile class was looked down as the low, the, low, the low class, whereas the professorial class was looked on as the high class part of China. And whether that, that still exists, and whether that essence uh, potentially could be um, built upon as a foundation as we go forward in China, might be important for all of us sitting in this room. May I introduce Ed Holrick Pierce, the director, founder of CRCC Asia. There's a few scholarships to hand out, and then we'll get on with our lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, so um, absolute pleasure to be here, and I won't uh, say it all over again, but thank you very much to the speakers and audience who made it here today. Um, you should all have CRCC Asia brochures in front of you. Um, we've now been running since 2006 and run definitely the largest and we like to think the most successful um, China internship program. Um, basically bringing students from UK, Australia, America, Canada and about 65 other countries out to China to gain work experience by placing them in local companies, um, sometimes multinational companies in a whole variety of industries. Um, I won't say any more, but um, we are very pleased to be here um, co-sponsoring or sponsoring the second um, China Goes Global lecture. And I did just want to mention that we have last year's scholarship winner in the audience, uh, Patrick, just behind Tom. Um, <laughs> Patrick is also uh, the co-chair <laughs> of the Pembroke College May Ball this year. But most importantly, I do have um, some announcements of this year's scholarship winners. Um, we have managed to increase the pot of funding a little bit, so we are now able to offer one um, Pembroke designated position, um, thanks solely to the Kirkwood Family Foundation, and one university wide. So um, if I could first ask if Jess Farmery is in the audience. Okay. Like yes. a photographer, you've got to come up and shake my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe at the same time, Samuel Barr could come up and. Um, well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Thank you for your welcome. It's great to, uh, great to be here in Cambridge um, talking about China. It's great to be anywhere talking about China. Um, I should uh, explain, I do uh, work for The Economist, but I'm not uh, an economist. Uh, there are a few of us who don't uh, 
loiter at the water cooler talking about uh, fiscal tightening. Um, I, I Um, write and edit pieces about the Chinese politics and society, mainly, of course, where that intersects with, um, with, the, uh, with the economy. Um, but uh, I was slightly daunted when I heard I was coming to the Judge Business School that uh, you were all going to be throwing uh, really difficult questions about the internationalization of the renminbi at me. Um, please don't. Oh, well, you can try. Um, uh, in fact, what I am going to talk to you about is not the complexities and the, uh, of uh, China's uh, financial uh, system, uh, nor, the, uh, nor the sort of details of the Chinese economy, but to stand way, way, way back um, and look at China uh, much more conceptually, much more historically, and to ask this big question, uh, what, does, uh, what does China want? Um, very much based on a, on, a, on a big article I wrote for The Economist um, uh, called What China Wants, which came out last year, um, uh, before I moved on to um, uh, writing about Britain. Uh, I'm now on the Britain section, and in fact, uh, I wrote the piece, I can admit this here, uh, I wrote the piece saying that o Cambridge is better than Oxford, um, which you may have seen in the last few months. Um, so um, when we talk about um, China, um, a lot of the question about what China wants um, comes within the context of um, this sort of fear that China's taking over the world. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of it is fear. There's always been fear of China going back to the sort of yellow peril of, the, of Fu Manchu and the, uh, uh, the, the sort of racist uh, uh, approach to, well, to the, re the, the whole of the rest of the world, but to, to China in particular, um, in, in the way that China was seen, this sort of fear of what China was going to do. And to some degree, that still persists, that China is going to take over the world. Having spent a lot of time in, in China, living in China, seven years uh, as a correspondent in China, you, you, you sort of feel a lot of that is, is rather overblown. Um, the closer, I always feel the closer you get to China, uh, the less you feel that China is going to uh, uh, take over the world, and the more you feel that it'll be a, a miracle if it holds together until nightfall. Um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of uh, noise out there about China. Um, and we, we really need to sort of cut through some of that to, uh, to, to look at China for what it is, not what our stereotypes uh, say it is or what our fears um, dress it up to be. And a great place to start, uh, any historians here will know about the visit of Lord McCartney in 1793, uh, who showed up in China to try and open the China market for trade and was told um, that China did not want anything that he had. He brought all sorts of gifts uh, from George III, and China didn't want anything. They said, get lost. Um, and it was like a red rag to the British bull, really, because, of course, the next 50 years were spent trying to prize open the China market. If you fast forward 200 years from there, you find yourself in a situation um, where China having, has gone very much from not wanting anything uh, that we have to wanting a lot of things very much. Um, wanting to be engaged internationally, wanting to uh, have resources, and wanting to re-establish the place in the world that it lost as it declined in the 19th century and was semi-colonized. So really at the heart of this question, and it's a very important question to ask, that Simon asked, you know, what are we, who are we talking about here when we say what does China want? We're talking very, very broadly. You know, often what the Chinese Communist Party wants is different from what the Chinese people want. This is an interesting question we can explore. But uh, broadly speaking, at the root of everything that China is doing, everything that we see in the South China Sea, in its relationship with Congress, in its exporting, in its investment, everything comes from the root of wanting to restore the respect that it believes it deserves, and that was destroyed by the arrival of the colonial powers in the 19th century. So the desire for wealth and power that is written on the Chinese soul is at the root of everything that we see. The need to restore its place at the top table um, and to become the country that it was before, for 1,700 years before uh, 
colonialism arrived, of course, it was the largest economy in the world. To achieve this, it has gone through some extraordinary convulsions. You probably know all the history of the, of the century of humiliation. I won't uh, go over it. The, uh, the Maoist era, uh, they freed themselves of the colonialists and then set about uh, devouring themselves. Um, and it was only with Deng Xiaoping that really China emerged uh, into the 1980s as a force that could, in some way, look to restore that wealth and power. 35 years, we know what has happened, 40 years of economic reform. China is now in a position of some wealth and in a position of some power as it uh, uh, deals with the outside world. But now it's in a situation where what it wants from the world is very, very contradictory. There's any number of contradictions within China. Um, but there's also these contradictions at the heart of what China wants. One of which is that in order to become the wealthy country and the strong country that it wants to be, it really, really wants the world order to stay the same. It needs its integrated remarkably well into the post-war post and the post-Cold War economic and international order. But in order to, uh, to uh, get the wealth and power and the respect that it wants, it also needs that world order to change. So we have a real contradiction at the heart of where China is, that it wants everything to stay the same so it can continue to grow economically while wanting everything to change so that it can have more influence uh, on the level of the amount that it believes it, uh, it warrants. And this contradiction could be leading us into some kind of collision. Domestically, we're seeing a contrasting dynamic. It wants everything to stay the same politically. Economically, it wants everything to change, to grow socially, to grow, to get much more developed, to bring that wealth and power that it so feels uh, that it deserves. And we should not deny when we criticize China, uh, sometimes quite rightly, for some of the internal policies that they apply to their people. I do not think we can in any way begrudge the Chinese people the aspirations of uh, enjoying some of the prosperity and freedoms that we in this room simply take for granted. But there is a contradiction here as well, because domestically they want everything to change uh, socially and economically, but they do not want it to change politically. And there is probably, I have to say, a collision domestically being stored up in all of this domestic change. Um, so two collisions that could be in the works as we see China trying to fulfill what it wants to be and what it believes that it should be. Let's look domestically first. Um, in, uh, in terms of the economy, briefly, um, what does it want domestically? It wants growth and stability. Those are the two things that it wants, growth and stability. The push for growth, of course, has sometimes led to instability. Making people richer sometimes makes them, often makes them happier and less likely to, to do unstable things. But one of the great fault lines that goes right the way through the heart of China is the inequality gap. The gap between the rich and the poor that is making the losers of economic reform very, very angry. So there are frailties as well as strengths. We've got the Industrial Revolution going on in China. Uh, we had a century for the dust of the Industrial Revolution to settle before the uh, information revolution came along, the technological revolution. In China, they're happen happening simultaneously with about 100 times as many people as we had. So there are these frailties, and economic development has come at a very high cost. So a lot of people are a lot happier. But there's been a very high cost, of course, economically, but environmentally, socially, just humanly, personally, to the people um, of China that makes people very worried. It makes people worried, never mind the frailty of the financial system, uh, the lack of transparency, 
all the economic problems of regional problems that are different in each part of China and the fact that you've got a massive empire the size of the United States controlled very top down from Beijing. It makes people worried about the economy and that there could be a hard landing and there could be um, big troubles as a result of the economic slowdown. Personally, even as a non-economist, I'm less concerned about the economic issues. I'm less concerned that an economic slowdown is going to lead to uh, instability. And I think that there is a much greater problem and a much bigger worry to do with China's social and political reform or lack of it. In the end, the Chinese government is very strong and it has a lot of money and it ha controls the levers of the economy imperfectly, in a rather sort of uh, very unnuanced way sometimes. But it is there standing behind the economy and able to do what is necessary to steer it in a sometimes a rather in, uh, un indelicate way. The issue with society and with, uh, with the politics, I think, is much more sensitive and much more difficult and much more likely to lead to problems um, within China. So what does China want? It wants, the Communist Party wants the economy to keep on growing and 7.4%, not bad. Most Western countries would, uh, would, would give their left arm for that. Um, even when we talk about a slowdown, it's far and above anything that any Western country is achieving. Domestically, though, politically, what's becoming clear now is what Xi Jinping wants. What he wants for society, of course, he wants the economy to keep on growing. And with all the imperfections and all the fallout and all the blowback and all the inequalities, that looks as though it's going to continue. What he started now, though, is a campaign, a political campaign since he came in, that is targeted at corruption, which is a real cancer in Chinese society, that is trying to weed out corruption, and he's gone absolutely flat out to try and go after corrupt people. If he were really going after everyone who's corrupt, he'd have to go after everybody. I'm sorry to our Chinese friends here. I'm, I think that it, everyone my Chinese friends all say that all officials are corrupt in China. That's not just the white man throwing stones. There is just a perception that all officials are corrupt. And of course, there are no checks and balances. So of course, there is a massive temptation to corruption. But more than that, Xi Jinping is going after liberal ideas and Western ideas. There's always this feeling of, oh, is the next leader going to be the Chinese Gorbachev? And Jiang Zemin wasn't, and Hu Jintao wasn't. And I don't believe, I think it's pretty clear that Xi Jinping doesn't intend to be either. So he's going after um, any kind of Western liberalization, any kind of uh, free thinkers within the system. And this makes, the, this makes the, the narrative of China in the West, of course, and I'm part of this, I'm, I'm trying to always write in a balanced way, but in the Western media, whenever there's a sort of clampdown, it's always perceived as, oh, oh, it's like some kind of 1970s clampdown. You know, and the, the people being locked up who are very brave people and should not be locked up are in some way uh, symbolic of what is going on in the broader society. And I don't believe that that is the case. Because what is happening in China is that traditionally, uh, in, in Marxist Maoist China, in communist China, you have always had a strong, uh, a, a strong state, uh, but a rather weak society. Now what has happened in China, with all the economic and social reform, is that you have, for the first time, a strong state still, but a very strong, uh, not a very strong, but a much stronger society. You're getting a lot of bottom-up empowerment. And so those brave dissidents who are saying, we want a de democratic system, they are being crushed, and they will continue to be crushed. And we should continue to say to the Communist Party, you should not crush those people. But there is a whole group of people, in fact, most of the population, who do not want to be political activists. They want to, as Simon just said, get rich, 
They want to make money. They want their children to do better than they did. It's the Chinese dream taking over from the American dream. And those people are the narrative of the last 10 years. Sometimes I think if you read the Western press, you'd think it was a narrative of oppression. Oh, continued clampdowns. In fact, the narrative of the last decade in China is the narrative of empowerment. Chinese people are being empowered every day by these social and economic changes. They are not being given multi-party democracy, but they are being given choice. They are being given um, freedoms to buy what they want, to do what they want, to think what they want, to marry who they want. They're all on the internet. When I went there as, uh, in the 1980s, mid-80s as a language student, there was a speaker outside my dormitory window that, which came on every morning with the, the, with the, CC, the, the Chinese radio news. It was one voice, everybody listened, just one voice. Now everybody in China is speaking to everybody else. Everyone's got a microphone. Everyone's on Weibo, or increasingly Weixin, the, the uh, WhatsApp equivalent. Uh, the internet, mobile telephony is utterly transforming the way people think. It's not turning China into a multi-party democracy, and it may not, certainly not for the next couple of decades, but it's affecting inside people's minds. It is maturing the Chinese mind, and it is empowering them in a way that they have never been empowered before. So I think this is a major part of what is going on and is... Uh, in many ways, dangerous for the Communist Party, not because the people are going to come out and may, uh, try and stage a demonstration to overthrow, uh, to overthrow the party, but because it is empowering people in a way that is colliding with the state's continued intent on pushing, pushing them down. And I think we're going to see more and more, as civil society groups, uh, many of them, are being closed down. No, you can't go and fund an NGO uh, that's trying to uh, work with environmentalists in China. There's, there is a clampdown on some of those NGO groups. But there is, at the same time, a continued empowerment within the minds of Chinese people that I think is the transformational uh, part of what is, what is going on here. Um, the Chinese Communist Party believes that um, China can't hold together without one-party rule. I think um, that, that possibly China... Well, I certainly think China can't become modern if it does still have Communist Party rule. China thinks that implementing rule of law is a dangerous thing to do. I think possibly not implementing rule of law is more dangerous. I think we're reaching a tipping point where what's going on in China is... Um, is that for so long, stability has, has depended on keeping everybody down. Now, it's getting to the point where people are so empowered, I wonder if China it is, it's going to be more dangerous for China to continue down that road than to actually embrace some kind of limited reform to cede some power in order to retain full power. Now, well, we may not like the Communist Party and we may not want them to stay in power, but we certainly don't want China to collapse. Uh, that would be not good for the Chinese people. It would be not good for our economies either. So structural reform in the form of some kind of move towards more rule of law, I think is right at the heart of what China needs to do. And increasingly, crucially, it's part of what Chinese people want. For a long time, the, the post Tiananmen deal was stay out of politics, you can do anything you want. You used to live in this little birdcage where everything was controlled. Now, everyone lives in an aviary. The roof has been lifted. You can't fly up to the clear blue sky, but you can do an awful lot inside the aviary. They can catch you if they want to, but there's just a lot of space. There's a lot of personal space as a foreign journalist living there and as a Chinese person. Um, uh, in, in, in a lot of things that you do. So I think uh, these areas uh, are where the key moments are in the coming decade 
is China going to not, not announce a multi-party uh, election, but move towards some kind of checks and balances within its system, and they're talking, there's all sorts of discussion about it, but of course, how do you bring any sort of judicial independence into a one-party system? Very, very difficult. They're talking about getting judges to be paid not by the local officials who appoint them, or getting judges within the system so that you can have some kind of legal redress so that, at the moment, all you can do is go and bang on City Hall, take 100 people from your village and stage a protest, in order to prevent those kind of demonstrations which they really don't want, I think they're going to need to start to think of some creative ways to deal with the contradictions emerging within Chinese society. At the same time, in terms of what China wants, I think looking just before we look at what it wants internationally, Xi Jinping has shown also that he is, um, A, he's not Gorbachev, B, he wants to, when he talks about restoring China, he really does have a historical model uh, in, his, in his mind. He's thinking about the 18th century, maybe not directly, but he's thinking about the old Qing Empire. This was when China was at its height. We need to rewind the clock 250 years, and that is China. And that does not involve any kind of reform uh, towards any kind of rule of law. We've got to crush all the Western ideas. We've got to launch some kind of uh, campaign to get rid of Western ideas in universities. Uh, and yet all the time these Western ideas are coming in. And I think the collision of those two um, is going to make the next decade um, very interesting indeed um, as the empowerment of the Chinese people grows, um, grows greater. Secondly then, uh, what does China want internationally? What does it want in, the, in, the, in global affairs? Um, the, the, uh, the phrase that Deng Xiaoping always used um, to Tao Guang, Yang Hui, uh, to uh, hide your light and bide your time, hide and bide. Just don't get out there, don't cause problems. We just need to just uh, uh, have stability so that we can grow the economy, so that we can slowly move towards this wealth uh, and power that we want. Well, if you look at the last couple of years, you might think that China has, uh, has put that aside. Uh, they're being much more assertive in the South China Sea. They're being much more assertive towards Japan. What's going on here? Uh, we read a lot of scary stories about China in Africa, China in Latin America. Oh, they're buying up the whole of Africa. Um, I think a lot of those stories actually are just scary stories. I think the sort of idea of a sort of neo-colonialist China is, is completely overblown. China's, China's um, engagement with Africa and Latin America, what it wants from Africa and Latin America, is copper, timber, tin, manganese, iron ore. It's transactional. It's business. It's trade. It's not some great sort of vision to, to make a second empire. There's a book just come out about China's empire in Africa. I, don't, I just think that is completely overblown. Um, part of that... Um, Part of that is, is again, historical. Um, it, it, it's it's uh, uh, what comes out of the roots of your culture. We come from a missionary culture. Uh, even if we, do, if we are not practicing Christians, we come from a culture that says that we know what the answer is and we want to go and tell everybody else how to live that way. Um, America is the supreme example of this, and Chinese people get very frustrated because... In Chinese culture, China is not a missionary culture. It's not a values superpower that says, oh, everyone's got to behave like this because I behave like this. So again, when we're looking at what China wants, we really have to go very, very deep into history to not just say, oh, well, they're like us because they're doing what we did 100 years ago. You've actually, that's not to say that China's not going to be a dane, the emergence of China is, is just going to be completely fine. There's clearly going to be a, a million challenges. But I think we have to understand some of the historical cultural dimension of what drives China before we start assessing what it is that they want to do. I think a lot of people say that, um, say, in fact, uh, far from China being too assertive, um, China, China needs to get actually a much, much more engaged in international affairs. China does the bare minimum 
on the international stage. Um, uh, uh, in this article, I, I interviewed a, a, a former senior official in the Bush administration who, uh, who said, oh, oh yeah, China loves to, come to the, loves to come to the G20, loves to show up and shake all the hands, but we're still waiting for their first idea. Um, they, they, they want to take part, but they've got so many problems at home, they can't think about what's going on in Africa. They haven't got a, some great sort of overarching policy for Africa, except to get the copper. <laughs> um, that may change. That may change. Um, but I think that we just need to make sure that we're not looking at some sort of neo-colonialist uh, uh, view that that, that that is what China um, is after. And I think um, when we talk about wanting more uh, Chinese engagement um, and, and not less, um, I, I think we, we need to be clear that we need to engage them as well. Uh, you may have read recently about China... Um, setting up two new banks, a new development bank and the, an Asian in infrastructure bank. Um, these are sort of vaguely sort of modeled on the World Bank and the IMF. Well, the reason that they have gone and set those up is because that they feel they're not being taken seriously or being given enough influence and enough say in the IMF and the World Bank. There's a danger that we're saying, stupid China, what are you doing all over the world? But we're, we're not engaging and thinking, hold on, China is soon going to be the biggest economy in the world. Of course it wants more say. Now, we can keep China out and say, no, we don't want communist China in here. Or we can look at China and say, this is a clearly very influential, growing influential country. We need to make sure it feels invested in the current system so that it doesn't go away and just set up its own organizations and say, all right, get lost, you Westerners, we're going to do our own thing. But of course, there's a problem here, of course, because if you look in the South China Sea um, or the East China Sea, you see China building airstrips on the little islands of the South China Sea. They're building uh, inhabit places, uh, in habitations for people, for soldiers. What's going on? Um, there is clearly a, a growing assertiveness there. I don't think China wants to rule the world, but this comes back again to history. It wants to be the dominant power in the Western Pacific. That is how it always was. Japan usurped that place in the 19th century. America came along and usurped that place in the 20th century. It wants the restoration of the natural order of Asia, which is China at the center. And so it is uh, in its head looking at some kind of, it's not a perfect uh, comparison, um, but the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, whereby James Monroe, the US president, look to keep European powers out of the Western Hemisphere. China, part of China really wants that. And the tension at the moment is because China really wants America to get lost, but at the same time kind of reluctantly realizes that it needs America in order to keep stability in the region. In the long term, it wants to get rid of America, but it knows it can't do without it in the short term. So um, it's challenging America in a rather clever way. What's happening in Southeast Asia is partly because President Obama is distracted by Syria, by a million things, part by Russia, um, partly also because uh, basically the Chinese see President Obama as a rather weak president and they think they can get away with it and they've been proved right. Um, they are basically... Salami, salami slicing their way to control of the South China Sea um, by threatening Asian countries with force, um, as they have done in the Philippines and in Vietnam by putting the oil rig out there um, in Vietnamese disputed water. They're confronting America with the choice of either deserting its friends or of fighting China. And China and the, and the Chinese are not stupid. They're not going to cross the red line that will lead America to come in militarily. America doesn't want to send in some troops or some kind of... It's got enough on its plate. But China very smartly is expanding its influence because it wants to, for some, some 
understandable reasons, its own security. What if there was a war over Taiwan? What if we can, couldn't control our own sea lanes? It wants to have, it wants to be able to control the, the, the area around its coast. How far are they willing to go to uh, achieve this dominance? Would they go to war uh, for, for it? Will they put troops on the Senkaku Islands sometime in the next decade? I think my guess is probably not. They want this, they want this dominance in Asia, but they're smart enough to see that they don't want to blow up 40 years of progress um, for some islands, um, even though they desperately want them back. And they see it very much as a long-term project. We can't think before more than four years ahead in America or five years here. The Chinese are looking towards 2049, the 100th year anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. That's where they're thinking, you know what, if this takes a few years, fine, we'll do it. We want to get it back and we want to, um, we're willing to take some time to do it. So finally, um, just to sum up, what should, uh, what should we do about what China wants? I think we should engage them more. They want respect. I think we can give them respect without selling out, without shutting up about the things that they do that we disagree with. I think the key areas probably in which we should engage and which we, that we should encourage them, of course, we need more military to military cooperation, especially the Pentagon needs to engage with China and not take China necessarily as the new enemy, even though often China is thinking that about America. But I think the key thing, it's all going to be domestic. It's all going to be domestic. What decides it is what happens in China. So the key thing is helping Chinese society to get to the point where it can move towards a more rules-based society, where it can uh, initiate some kind of reforms that bring some checks and balances. Not to try and transplant Westminster democracy to China, but to try, there is a bridge that needs to be built to the future. Because Xi Jinping's model of going back to Qing dynasty imperial rule is not going to work. It'll work for 10 years, but then it'll blow up. Because empowered people from underneath are not going to put up with it forever. And the bridge to the future, I think, is civil society. It's the, it's the empowerment of groups between the individual and the state. You're seeing it now, you're seeing it in the churches. Talk about what do Chinese people want? What do they, what do they want? The boom of religion, religious belief in China now. You're seeing labor unions that are now starting to uh, uh, gain a little bit more power possibly. Uh, if they're not being allowed to uh, flourish independently, there is at least a consciousness of uh, bargaining rights and how to get more power for Chinese workers. Um, all of these civil society institutions, I think, are the bridge to the future for China that we should be engaging with. And we should be, and interestingly, and this is a whole, we could talk about this in questions, the Chinese government is finding, after 30 years of thinking that these are Trojan horses for overthrowing China, has now found that it can't deal with all the social problems, and, and how am I going to deal with all the rural children and all the old grannies and the disabled people? We haven't, we're not able to do that. And suddenly it's finding, oh, there's all these Christians and Buddhists who have set up NGOs to deal with these uh, people. And they're now engaging with civil society and actually funding civil society in order to be able to help these areas. This is, I think, a... There's a lot of tension on, on NGOs still, but there is also a lot of empowerment. And I think that is a crucial part for where China wants to go in order to get across the bridge to what the future is going to be. What can China do about what China wants? I put it at the end of this, uh, of this, of this piece that, that you can read. Um, and it's very slightly sort of esoteric viewpoint, but it comes back really to domestic reform again. Um, that in the old days, uh, China, Chinese culture was, was loved and respected and admired. And what, in fact, you have now is that there's a lot of admiration for China as a development model, 
but there's not a lot of uh, admiration of it as an attractive civilization. So China has this extraordinary civilization. It has an extraordinary culture dating way back um, uh, thousands and thousands of years. I think um, it's difficult to restore that, though, of course. And this is the classic Western liberal viewpoint, but I guess I'm, in some ways at least, a, a, Western, a classic Western li liberal. You can't achieve that in a one-party state. You can't achieve um, creating the soft power. The soft power China is trying to generate with its Confucius Institutes and its top-down soft power, that's not what, that isn't soft power if you're trying to implement it from on high. It needs to get back to, uh, to, to rediscovering its attractiveness as a civilization. Um, and that, of course, again, I'm afraid, comes down eventually to social, judicial, um, and eventually uh, political reform, which will create a more bottom-up culture that thrives with the participation of the people. I think it is more dangerous for China and for the world that China does not reform in this, uh, the, the, in this way than if it does, which is clearly what the Communist Party still believes. Sorry, I've gone a bit over time. Do obviously uh, ask any questions that you'd like to. Thank you very much. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's great to actually have um, uh, Charles Kirkwood, um, who is um, a very eminent and practical business person, has plenty of experience um, uh, in China for a long period now. And it's one of the kind of quite, I think, important American organizations that's that stood by China for a long time through, through, through uh, thick, thick and thin. Um, but also Sir Christopher Hum, um, who um, has had a, a really um, outstanding career um, in the Foreign Office, um, working in Hong Kong and East Asia and so on, um, and in particular was the uh, British Ambassador to China between, I think, 2002 and six. Yep. Um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, joining us up here. I felt that what Rob said was um, extremely comprehensive, and uh, I would agree with a great deal of his analysis. Um, perhaps I was a, a practicing uh, diplomat in China, beginning actually during the Cultural Revolution, going a long way back, uh, and more recently, as you heard, I was ambassador. So perhaps I can just say a couple of things about um, experiences I had, which very much chime with some of the things that Bob was talking about. Um, in my professional encounters, I was struck how frequently the subtext was respect. Um, when we had major encounters between um, political figures at the top, when we had state visits, when we had visits to Britain, uh, when my American colleague had visits to Washington, we were each independently struck by the fact that what mattered, what was first and foremost in Chinese minds, was not the substance of the visit, but it was about the imagery and the appearance of the visit. Was it going to be a state visit? Was there going to be a band? Was there going to be um, a guard of honor? How large would it be? How many motorcycles would accompany the motorcade? Um, in other words, it was very much about uh, ensuring that China was projected as a great power, as a major power, and as an equal with the power with which it was doing business. Uh, equally, uh, respect underlay other things. If I think about the, the occasions on which I was summoned to be talked to by Chinese leaders, um, it was very often about things which were not, in fact, international affairs, but they were about an expression of the um, Chinese sovereignty and ways in which it was considered that these might be a, a threat. So if I was summoned by the foreign minister and not one of his underlings, and if to just to rub it in, it was done at an antisocial time of day, I knew it was not going to be to talk about the Middle East. It was going to be to talk about 
the travel plans of the Dalai Lama. Again, it was about ensuring that China was treated in a way which was consistent with its own conception of its, the extent of its sovereignty, which I found interesting. At the time that I was there, um, there was underground a, a debate going on, which has surfaced since, about really whether an activist diplomatic stance was in China's interests or not. And there were respectable people, diplomats, writing academic papers saying, no, we shouldn't. It's all a trap. It's a trap to enmesh us and to limit our freedom of action. Now I think it is clear that there is going to be a more activist diplomacy. Um, if you look at the sort of um, um, slogans that there are about it now, it is all about cooperation, win-win, uh, joint security. It is the beginnings of a more outward-going posture, uh, which I, for one, find very um, uh, encouraging as far as the rhetoric goes. Um, we have to see whether that now matches up to China's activity on the ground. But I think there is, as Bob said, a terrific, as Rob said, a terrific ability to engage with China. China has a huge amount of contribution to make. And it is now a matter of engaging that, making space for China, finding room in the institutions for China to exercise the weight that it deserves. And I think then there's a great deal to be offered to diplomatic activity in the world. I first went to China in 1985, leaving an American delegation uh, invited by the Chinese to help them in their oil and gas concessionary law. I'm in the oil and gas business. I am a businessman. I have to give my comments on what I thought was incidentally a, a wonderful uh, presentation. I do not speak Chinese, unfortunately. My son and my grandson, who are here, do speak, and granddaughter, do speak Chinese. So I, as usual, I learn from them. But I am a, have a much more practical view of what the Chinese want based on our own business experiences there. And that is that they want continuous, significant economic growth. They are very focused on technology, and they believe that technology will play a very important role in the, not just in China, but in all the many things that the world is facing from the environment to immigration. I'm an American, though they're hot issues in our election right now. What was the largest public offering of any company ever in the world in the New York Stock Exchange this past September? Alibaba, $25 billion raised. There'd never been a public offering, anything like that. And they have a subsidiary, Alipay, which is transforming payments in China. They're leapfrogging in the area of technology. Uh, Ali, Alipay is a way for people to pay their bills, but not only that. If you have an Alipay account, you can buy a stock market or a retirement fund. You can earn more than you earn in a bank. It's an incredibly big leap over what are problems in the West. I won't go on except to make this point. I sit on a board at Columbia University. You would be astounded at how much of the research being done in New York is done by Chinese nationals. There's hardly a paper published in the field that I'm involved in that doesn't have a Chinese researcher, or even in oil and gas, if you read the oil and gas journal, many of the technological advances in that journal are done by mainland Chinese. So what do they want? I don't know what they want as far as social. I don't know what they want as far as the individual rights. I know two things they want. They want a booming economy to continue, and it is continuing in almost every field, and they want advancements in technology which are continuing wherever you turn, whether it is medicine or whether it is oil and gas, the two fields that I am involved in. And I don't mean by any means to detract from the remarks that have been made by our speaker with regard to those things which are conceptually and probably true. They want respect. They want power, I believe. But I know 
They want continuous economic growth, and they want continuous development of technology. Thank you very much. So with that, um, we'll open the floor to um, questions. It seems to me uh, from the remarks that have been made to be a case of um, a confident public and an unconfident state, which is, n has occurred before in ma major uh, ele outfits like China. Um, I just want to ask a question uh, of the main speaker with regard to the view that um, China is um, really only interested in its near surroundings in essentially recovering its role in the Western Pacific. Um, my impression, it's not my field at all, I don't know, it's just a sort of newspaper reader, is that uh, that unconfident state is remarkably unadroit, unimaginative in dealing with its nearest neighbors, Vietnam, Indonesia, anybody who has a Muslim population, uh, to say nothing of, yet, of Tibet, uh, Korea, of course, uh, the Philippines. Why is this? Uh, is it a fa state failure? I think I've got one. Lack of yeah. confidence? Um, uh, why are they so clumsy and uh, unable to, in their... Uh, appear to attach no importance to it. I mean, they attach much more importance to what... Uh, Americans think about dead events like Tiananmen Square, then... Uh well, um, I, I'm sure Christopher will have something to say about this and a lot of experience of dealing with Chinese diplomacy. I would say part of that is uh, size. Part of it, uh, it came out, there's a famous incident where the, the Chinese foreign minister was, was caught on, uh, on record saying... Uh, g getting angry with uh, with America, Hillary Clinton, but also with the um, the, the ASEAN countries, where he said, um, "Well, China is a big country, and you are all small countries, and that is just that." Um, you know, and th that is quite revealing. I I'm not sure that uh, the, the the descendants of the British Empire or, or, or of the American Empire are in a point a place to point fingers um, at uh, countries who throw their weight around. Um, but there is a growing uh, sense uh, in China that their time has come, I think. And that is, uh, there is a slightly edgy side to that. Um, I don't think they are, uh, they are not nearly as colonialist. I mean, there's a whole question of Tibet and Xinjiang and whether they are historically part of China, but um, the, the Chinese, uh, although they are not setting out to go and uh, colonize Southeast Asia, they do have a very large chip on their shoulder. And so there is a narrative of victimhood that is very deep in the Chinese psyche. And so part of what is happening now is overturning that whole 200 years of being the victim. And I think that translates into a sort of chippiness and a sort of rather blunt instrument approach that, OK, we're here now, we're big, you little countries can just shut up. Um, I think it's, it's what comes with, you know, suddenly grow, going from being a, an 11-year-old to suddenly being six foot four as a 13 year old and, and you don't know what to do with your newfound power. You've, you used to be bullied but now you're bigger than all the other people and you're sort of throwing your weight around. You don't realize that throwing your weight around gets everyone else to gang up on you. Um, I think all of that is sort of is, is part of it. Um, and I think there's just an inevitable, there's an inevitable sort of uh, any, any power, emergent power, Germany, Japan, sort of starts to sort of uh, shake the order a little bit. Christopher, you may have some insights into lack of adroitness. <laughs> I think the only thing to add is that, that um, in, in reasserting itself in this way, it is harking back a little bit to the period before the century of humiliation, because what 
happened before then, of course, what was the situation for hundreds and thousands of years before that, was that China's um, physical power, China's cultural power, <coughs> held sway over this entire area. Um, it was subject to degrees of tributary relations of various types. Uh, some were kind of grown-up tributary partners, and others were the lesser tributary partners, who were actually described as barbarians and handled by the, the, uh, the department responsible for barbarians. And I think, in a, in a way, in, in overcoming this period of, of extreme shame and humiliation, we can all understand that, there is a slight harking back to the period when China radiated power over this entire area and expected the countries surrounding China to recognize that and to behave accordingly. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a comment and a couple of questions. Uh, one is that um, I think it's not only Southeast Asia, but also South Asia as such. Like, for instance, recently there has been a um, contribution of China in infrastructure building and dissemination of intelligence to places like Sri Lanka, which is a very strategic way of going about with um, having a say in that region. And I think uh, that's that's a covert way of neo-colonialism as I see it. But um, I mean, it's, it's a very subtle way of going about with it. Uh, that's what I see it as. Uh, the, the questions that I have are um, regarding whether the changes and the reforms will be internal or uh, like from from the bottom up or from top down because uh, there are these glaring contradictions in terms of ideology in terms of stances within the ruling uh, regime uh, there is the uh, communist uh, faction which is there and there is a very significantly right of center uh, factions which are uh, present at the moment. So do you think that it will be from uh, the provinces or from the top, uh, da, uh, from the bottom up that uh, these reforms will come about? Um, and the other question relates to whether before the century of humiliation, Japan had a very significant, I mean, the reforms that went about in Japan uh, had a say in how China went about with it subsequently. I mean, uh, there was this, the whole um, modernization era that came about in Japan, which led eventually to the Chinese um, reforms. Do you think there will be a repeat of that in a manner of saying in this modern era? Because I think uh, that could possibly be one of the reasons for stimulating and uh, catalyzing that kind of a reform. In Japan or in China? Uh, in China, looking at Japan, I guess. I don't see China harking back to the way in which Japan uh, went about its own, its own modernization. I think China has simply gone too far uh, along its own course. Um, I think also that China um, is not going to be taught any lessons by Japan at all. And for the next uh, few decades ahead, one of the real flashpoints of the region is, of course, going to be the unfinished business between China and Japan, which is partly territorially but um, it is based much more fundamentally on China's perception that Japan, which is shared to an extent by South Korea, that, China has, that Japan has not yet come to terms with what it did during the Second World War and the period before that, uh, and needs first to um, undergo a sort of purification, which in Chinese eyes, Germany has performed, Japan has not. I would uh, I would agree with Christopher on that. Um, I mean, I basically, if you're I mean, talking about the Meiji Restoration, what happened in Japan, essentially China has eventually done that. It's already done that. I mean, that was the problem, was that Matthew Perry arrived in Japan, and Japan went, ooh, we're behind, let's go. China took 50 years to... to to contort its soul to go, oh, no, we can't, we can't do that because they're barbarians. But eventually, after 100 years, they did do that, and so this is the result. So I think I agree with Christopher. They don't want to admit they're going to learn from Japan. But I think, and they have already gone through their Meiji Restoration, but, but I think they do look to Japan. They want to challenge Japan. They, they're looking at, probably at Japanese economic policy of the of the 60s and 70s and seeing what they can learn absolutely same with Taiwan South Korea what they went through in the 70s and 80s they're absolutely wanting to learn as much as they can from anybody they can although they won't admit that they learn anything from the Japanese um, uh, in terms of neo-colonialism I think I think we just uh, I mean it's to do with definitions I, I think 
uh, strategic engagement by China in Sri Lanka is not neo-colonialism. Helping to build a port in southern Pakistan is also not neo-colonialism. It's a uh, clever strategy uh, by the Chinese, which we may not like, certainly the Indians don't like, but um, it's just the Chinese being savvy and looking around, seeing who their allies are, wanting to have more allies, having a lot of money in their pockets and buying influence and, and uh, friends in the region just to be able to sort of be able to have, you know, ways to buff, have a buffer against, uh, against India in some ways. Um, top down or bottom up, I think the change is coming from the bottom up, but it has to get the sign off at the top. So, so you know, there can be, uh, and this is where, if you're talking of South Korea and Taiwan, this is where what happened there is relevant. Um, you know, the difference is, of course, that Taiwan is 22 million people and smaller than the smallest Chinese province. So, so you know, they turned all the Taiwanese people into middle class people, brought them in from the fields in one generation. Suddenly everybody was middle class and it was just kind of natural that, that Jiang Jingguo would just say, OK, let's have an election because civil society, the economy, the whole of society had changed. In China, you know, you've got, you've got the 400 million people, new middle class, but you've still got 700, 800 million people in the countryside, you know. So, so in terms of the sort of bottom-up push, they are not yet affecting that kind of change from below because the party thinks we've got to hold these 400 million new middle class in a sort of urban holding pen while we bring the other 700 million into the cities. We can't give these people the changes that Taiwan and South Korea gave them as they entered into the political reform of the 1980s because we haven't brought the other 700 million in. So a lot of what is going on in China is governed by geography and demography. And it's simply just a really big place. Um, and, and I think that when the time comes, there will, be a, there will be more and more and more pressure from below. And it will be pushing for change. And it may come before the 700 million have been brought into the city. It may well. Actually, it probably will. But if they're going to go down any road of reform, it has to be signed off on from, from the top. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Go, go, go. so I was just going to add one point, yeah. and that is that I don't think we should underestimate the, the, the power that the top has still over the bottom. Mm. China's uh, internal security budget is higher than its external defense budget. Its internal security forces are very numerous, they're extremely well uh, equipped. Uh, and they're capable at the moment of holding down Tibet, uh, holding down Xinjiang. Um, so they have a lot of, they still have a lot of power still in their hands. Rob, d does the Chinese woman want a female American president? <laughs> <laughs> Questions I wasn't expecting. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think the Chinese woman, in as much as I know what she is thinking, um, I think would be rather intrigued by a female American uh, president. Um, is a female American president considered to be a weak president or a strong president? I think they know that if the woman in question who we're talking about, they don't actually like very much because they know she's quite a tough person. Uh, going back to the women's conference when Hillary Clinton was at the women's conference in Beijing in 1995, where she really was very tough and has continued to be tough on China. Um, I think they see, uh, I mean, just to broaden your question a bit, I, I think they see who, I think they probably, one of the reasons what's going on in South China Sea is going on is because they see Obama as quite weak, that the pivot doesn't really amount to anything. And they see either Hillary Clinton or a Republican coming down the pike. And either of those two choices is probably going to be tougher on them than Obama has been. Um, as far as the sort of the women's point of view is concerned, uh, what's the broader point to make about that? Uh, I, they well, would... Do they have a force? I 
mean, you talked about civil organisation, yeah. and, and you, you didn't mention women at all no. in your talk. Which, do, do they play? You don't see them at the higher level. Uh, you don't, government. but uh, if you took away the wealth differential, which is no small thing, I think I would rather be a Chinese woman than a Japanese woman. In terms of their status and their participation in society, some of our Chinese friends, I'm sure there's some Chinese women in the audience, or people who've been to China might disagree. Chinese women really participate. They are really, I mean, Chairman Mao did, uh, destroyed China, but he did two good things. He raised life expectancy, he almost doubled life expectancy, and he said women hold up half the sky, and he set about making sure they did. Uh, Chinese women uh, have many problems, and a lot of actually the, the old masculine sort of macho domination of society is now re-emerging now that communism is, is in decline. Uh, and that's causing a lot of problems in terms of domestic violence, in terms of all the problems that all societies have. But Chinese women are a real force and you don't see them at the very highest levels, but they really participate in Chinese society. Charles, do you have an American perspective on this? <laughs> well, I, th I find it the most intriguing and unexpected uh, question. I, I do believe, though, that American politics, particularly presidential politics, has never really focused on foreign policy. It has not been an issue in our elections. I personally think that is going to change. I think there's significantly more interest, partially because of the Middle East, but there's more interest in the, uh, in, in the foreign policy in this election. As to, I mean, I'm not going to make any predictions about what's going to happen. I just don't know whether uh, the Chinese ever even think about that question. But I certainly agree, Robbie, with your comment about the strength and position of Chinese women. Doing business in China invariably involved Chinese women at the top of the uh, financial markets, at marketing, at technology. And if you just look in this country, uh, I mean in America, I think the same is true in England, we have an almost equal balance of number of uh, Chinese female students as male students studying in the United States. So, Ian, I know your question was a little bit facetious, but my, my answer is that the role of Chinese women is very emancipated and very powerful, so I don't think they would think it terribly surprising if we had an American <coughs> woman president. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. This is very uh, enlightening and illuminating. I just have a, two, two quick questions. One's about the uh, Chinese economy as, as far as it, its uh, global impact is com concerned about about the economic slowdown that happens globally in the recession. Uh, what impact can it have on, on the manufacturing industry, which is sort of the backbone of China? And, and does China, uh, as an economy, or the, does the government in China have an alternative to, to that manufacturing industry if it, if it collapses and, and that external demand for, for Chinese goods sort of uh, erodes away with, with a lot of countries looking internally? And can China come up with an alternative to that to sustain the economy. And, and the second one is about the overall issue of what China wants and, and uh, the issue of, of respect. And does the West and, and people outside of China think uh, that the demands, as far as respect is concerned, uh, is China overreaching or uh, what, what, they, what they want is, is practically un unachievable in today's context? Thank you. I'll take the first part uh, of the question. Although exports have been extraordinarily important in the growth so far, I think their official policy is to uh, stimulate domestic demand. And I, they sure as hell have done that. If you go to China and take, for instance, the number of cars sold in China exceeds the number sold in America already and the future demand. So I don't think that's sort of a, an important trade-off, the fact that their manufacturing exports are going slightly well, less than they were before. I think Chinese I internal consumption and demand is so huge that it won't have a huge effect on the, uh, on the domestic economy. And I, almost any sector of the Chinese economy you looked at, I'm talking about domestic demand from houses to uh, baby food, it's going up tremendously. So I don't think the, the export slight decline has a major role. Uh, 
Um, you know, I, I agree. Your second, your, sorry, your second half is, is, is China overreaching? Is it unavoidable? In terms of uh, what, what China believes is its position, does, does people outside of China believe that it's, it's something that China wants more than they, they can have? And, and what China initially wants is, is it even achievable in today's context? Of, of like achieving that power of, of 1800. So. Right. I, I think that's, that's the great tension, is what the rest of Asia thinks. And I think, uh, I'm not sure it's completely zero sum. I think there's a sort of danger we sort of think, oh, China or America. I think a lot of Asian countries are a bit freaked out by China's growth. So they want America to stay. But if they're thinking long term. I mean, if you're thinking 100 years, is America still going to be there? I mean, um, Southeast Asian countries want to be able to get along with China. And they know that actually their economies rely on China. But do they want America to leave? Absolutely not. And so they're sort of hedging, uh, they're, they're, they're staying close to Uncle Sam at the same time as not they don't want to diss China. China matters a great deal, but it's just sort of trying to juggle. It's not even necessarily playing one off against the other, but they are trying to juggle or just balance um, that, that dynamic because undoubtedly, especially because of Chinese activities on the islands and the reefs, they are worried about the possibility of Chinese, I mean, not invasion, but, you know, a Chinese sort of assertiveness. And they are small, and China moves its oil rig into disputed waters, Vietnamese waters. You know, China's, China's just big. And so, so I think there is a great deal of concern, which means that, in fact, America will stay there for the foreseeable future. Uh, could I just add that we've, we've barely referred to India, and that's a very interesting element in the future. You have a country which has a much... Um, better demographic profile than China does. Um, in two or three years' time, it could be growing at a faster rate than China. Um, it is a country which has um, aspirations of its own, uh, even though those aspirations have not been very significantly realized over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, I think the, the relationship between China and India is going to be very interesting. They still have a huge area of territory which is disputed between them, which is occupied by India, but uh, is confronted uh, by China right high up in the Himalayas. So that, I think, is one reason why China cannot go back to the 18th century certainties. There is, among other things, there is an India next door which has its own aspirations as well. Thank you. I'll try and keep my comments brief. Briefly to say, um, I my credentials are that I first visited China in 1965 as a student from here. And that was before the Cultural Revolution. So at close quarters, I've seen China develop over many years. And I've also been in China uh, with Christopher as well on a couple of visits. What I wanted to say was China, it's difficult to know where to begin to try to understand China. And you can see from the range of questions, and I want to suggest two words that are at the heart of any understanding of China. One is prosperity and the other is stability. Having engaged in a civil war during the Cultural Revolution, what China wants more than anything is stability. And only through stability can they achieve prosperity. The two are very, very linked together. And that's why at the heart of China's development is a keen commitment and determination to ensure that civil, civil society remains on a stable path because that will ensure some kind of prosperity. That will ensure that people have an interest and support for the development of the system. And I want to make just this one point. The challenge to that stability comes at the moment from corruption in China. The Chinese are so aware of it. They don't have checks and balances, as Rob has said. They don't have a free press. They don't have the Sun and the Mail eager to expose their leaders, which call our leaders to account. And even now, we still have a lot of corruption in, in amongst our leaders. But in China, they know that if they don't deal with this problem of corruption, that relationship between the party and the people will be lost. 
And they have that, Xi Jinping has a short period of time to ensure that he is able to reinstate that relationship in order to maintain the unity of China. And what he's doing deserves very, very uh, serious consideration because if he fails, then China really is moving towards instability. Personally, it's my own view, I think he will succeed. There will be a lot of victims on the way and there will be an introduction of a legal system based on the rule of law which to some extent will...